Anyways, let's, uh, let's go into um, James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. <clears throat> Let me read the whole passage to the end of the chapter, and then we'll, uh, we'll begin to unpack it. Um, beginning verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works, and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works, when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So this is the famous passage that our um, far, far, far cousins, the Roman Catholics, like to uh, use in order to prop up the doctrine that they have that uh, the faith that justifies, okay, the faith that justifies is a faith that works. In other words, in other words, they would say that faith must be formed by love. Fides formata. Uh, faith must be formed by love in order for God to accept you. Okay? This is Roman Catholic doctrine that was rejected by the reformers. So, faith formed by love. What does that mean? What it means is that what is of the essence of faith, what gives faith is essential, good quality of value before God. It's not just faith alone. It's a faith that works. Okay? It's a faith that works. Roman Catholics would say, it's good to have faith, but it is not sufficient. Faith alone is not sufficient to be accepted before God. Obviously, in the mind of Roman Catholics, faith alone is nothing but a simple understanding and ascend to the doctrines of the church. Okay? If you know the doctrines of the church and you ascend to them, that is faith, okay? But that faith alone does not save you. According to Roman Catholic doctrine, faith must be formed by love. And love is the infusion of grace that you acquire at your conversion or when you receive the sacraments. So faith then is the infusion of the virtue of love. And that is then how you are justified before God. Okay? So that is the challenge that, that we have before us. Okay? Um, something similar to this also comes from uh, the reform camp itself. Where it says that... Um, 
works are of the essence of justifying faith. That indeed, um, you know, we are justified by faith alone, um, the reform would say. However, the faith that is justified before God by faith alone is, is also a faith that will work. It's also a faith that is, is a faith that counts before God. At some point it counts before God because it proves itself in the working, in the loving and that is why then it's the whole package of being justified before God uh, at the beginning by faith. But somehow, before you make it to heaven, that faith has to prove uh, true, genuine by works. Hence, you have the concept of final justification which looks at the final judgment according to works and says, see, it is at that judgment that eventually true faith will be vindicated. And it will be vindicated in the sense that not only do you have faith alone, but that faith is not alone, it works. There's a righteousness, there's a holiness to it. And that is necessary to be saved, to be accepted by God. It's not perfect, but yet must be there for God to accept you. Whichever way you look at it, both camps are saying, faith alone, bare, naked, without works, does not suffice. Okay? We want to say, yes it does. Yes, faith alone, naked, bare, without works, is enough, sufficient to get you accepted before God. Okay? So the question then becomes, what is the meaning of uh, this verse here that we read that says... Is the word justified in there uh, the exact meaning of the word No, that's exactly how the argument goes. Okay, so here is in verse 24, right? You see then that a man is justified by works and not... By faith only. You see? Roman Catholic point. You see? They're justified by works. Not by faith only. So let's go with that argument. Let's say that we're debating now. One of these two arguments that just we just laid out. Well, I have, I have an account. Like for example. Mm -hmm. oh, That's okay. But I always think of that guy next to Jesus on the cross. Yeah. What time did he have to produce any works? Well, what we want to say. We're going to get to that. But what we want to say to that is that that guy... I did have some good works, okay? Yeah, well, we're going to address that too, okay? We're going to address that too. But let's, let's begin by, by uh, examining, scrutinizing the idea that a person, whether or not a person, <clears throat> can be justified by faith without works, okay? Because if we can prove that, then James cannot be contradicting somebody else, in this case Paul. And then James must be talking about something else in this justification. So we go, let's go to Paul and let's go to Romans, uh, Romans chapter 3, asking that question, can faith alone justify or faith alone is not enough and you also need the works, okay? So we see in Romans chapter 3, let us begin there, <clears throat> Romans chapter 3, <clears throat> beginning in verse uh, 19. Beginning in verse 19. It, <laughs> yeah. Beginning in verse 19, uh, it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Now, let me ask you. There's a mention here of the law. What is the mechanism of the law? How does the law speak? What does the law demand? Works. Works. Yes. And it has a very, there's a very specific language that you can attach to it, which says the following. Do this and you shall live. Okay? Do this. And you shall live. That's the way the law speaks. We see that in Galatians, right? For example, if you go to Galatians, 
uh, you hear Paul explaining the way the law speaks in Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3, it says in verse 12, verse 12 of Galatians 3, yet the law is not of faith. You see that? The law is not of faith. Why? Why is that? Why is the law not of faith? Because the man who does these things shall live by them. You see the language of the law? You do these things and you live by them, okay? You must do these things. How many things? All things, right? That's why um, uh, Paul here in Galatians says in verse 10, you, you uh, go a little bit further up into verse 10, Galatians 3.10. And Paul says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse... For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You see? So how does the law speak? You do these things and you live, right? The man who does these things lives by doing them, right? How many things? Partial? The majority of them? No. How many? All of them. So that's the language of the law. And the law is summed up in, Thou shalt love God with all your heart, mind, and strength, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. So the law says, you want to live, you must love God perfectly, without fa failure, and you must love your neighbor also, like this, you know, without failing to do so. So that's the language of the law, okay? So we go back to Romans 3, and it says... Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, by the works of the law, right? By working the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. You see that? No flesh will be justified in his sight uh, by the doing of the law, by the working of the law, by the principle of if I do this, I live. Okay, so what is the purpose of the law then? Paul says here, it was given that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. For by the law, verse 20 Verse 20, the last part, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, the opinion legis of the law, the law semper accusatab, the law, the law always accuses. So the law does a lot of things. It tells you about a lot of wonderful things, okay? It tells you and it explains to you many wonderful things. However, in all of those wonderful things that it explains to you and that it commands you to do, it always does something. It accuses you. It holds, it holds, it holds you guilty. That's what the law does. Why? Because the law speaks like this. Do these things if you want to live. So it tells us what the things are, wonderful things, great things, but then we fail to do it. You know, Pastor, I'm sorry, but yeah. it also tells me, in a way, like, if you want to save yourself, do it by doing these things. Correct. And that, you realize you cannot yeah, save yourself. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, there's nothing, um, uh, there's nothing, in other words, it's, it's the proper way of living. In other words, God commands of all his moral creatures the good. The good, the, the, the moral rightness that he requires according to his character. That's why he says in Romans 2, in Romans 2 he says, uh, in verse, um, uh, Romans 2, you know, he, uh, he's explaining the right, the just uh, judgment of God. Okay, and then he goes on to say in Romans 2, that God would, verse 6, that he will render to each one according to his works. 
Okay, and then he goes on to say, verse 12, For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Verse 13, this is where I wanted to get. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So there it is. The law says, you want to be justified according to my, my righteous standards? Yeah, I command you to do it. You must do it. You, mu you must be a doer of the law. So this is Roman Catholic right here. It, correct. You must be a doer of the law. However, and there, there, there's a nuance there because uh, the Roman Catholics are going to say that you are helped by grace to do it. You are empowered by grace to do it. Okay, you're empowered by the sacraments, by grace, you know, by the change that has happened in you, because now you have infused grace, so now you do it. However, the problem is that the law keeps saying to you, you must abide in all things. You must abide in all things of the law. So the law has this language. It righteously demands that you be a doer of it. God cannot demand any less according to his character. He says, I am holy, I am righteous, and I demand you to be the same. You want to, you want to be justified in my sight? Be a doer of the law. And God is going to judge everyone, everyone, according to the law. In other words, on judgment day, everyone is going to be judged according to righteousness, according to what is right according to the doing of right, according to what conforms to the law. So he says, it's just the doers of the law that will be justified, okay? So, are, are we there? Now, when we advance to uh, Romans 3, we hear then, yeah, okay, the law demands that we do its perfect uh, standards. However, what it ends up doing what it ends up doing is that it accuses you, right? And it condemns you. It accuses you and it condemns you. So by the deeds of the law, by doing, by ourselves doing the law, no one will be justified. Now we get to verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God, apart from the law. You see that? Apart from the law. Okay? What does it mean apart from the law? Without the law. Apart from it. In, in your own doing. Okay? The righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So, the, what is righteousness? Being conformed to God's demands. Okay? Perfectly conformed. Perf it's the doing. It's the doing of the law. Being righteous is the doing of the law, okay? Now, Paul is saying there's a righteousness of God. There's a being conformed to God apart from the law. Apart from, apart from what? Do this and you shall live. There is a being conformed to righteousness apart from do this and you shall live. You following that? So there's a way unto righteousness, unto being conformed, and, and be conformed to God's standards, be standing in the presence of God as a doer of the law, that paradoxically, I guess you would say, does not involve do this and you shall live. It's apart from that principle. Okay, let's see if we, if we keep on, on advancing. So, be, and, and, this, and this way to righteousness apart from do this and you shall live, is witness to by the law itself. By the law itself. In other words, the law that was given witnesses, bears witness, points, right, to another way of being uh, conformed to God's righteousness. It is witnessed by the law, and then it says it is also witnessed by the prophets. It's talking about scripture. And I guess you begin to um, kind of guess who here is being witnessed to. That is witnessed to in the law. And that is witnessed to in the prophets as 
a way to righteousness, not by the principle of do this and you shall live, but by another principle. What is that principle? Verse 23. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. So there's the other way. You see? So notice then that you have the way of the law. Do this and you shall live. And you have the way of believe in Jesus and you shall live. Which is the way, another way of the righteousness. This is the, this is the way that Paul calls it. The righteousness of God apart from the law. There is the righteousness of the law that says do this and you shall live. And that is, God demands that. But there is a way to righteousness not by the law principle of do this and you shall live. There is a way to righteousness by the principle of believe in Jesus and you shall live. And you're righteous. Are we there so far? So note what I want you to see is one is the way of doing and the other is the way of what? Of believing. Um, James seems to be saying on the surface that you have to have what? Both together to be justified. That it cannot be just by faith alone, right? But that you also have to have the works, the doing, okay? The doing. And unless you have both, you can be justified. But we're seeing here, therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, apart from the principle of works, apart from doing, apart from doing this and you shall live. Let's keep on reading and you're going to see how Paul makes it even, even uh, clearer. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 23. Verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We are justified freely by grace. Okay? So two things. You can either be justified by merit... Merit involves do this and you shall live. Okay? So you can be justified by merit. Merit involves do this and you are righteous, you live. Right? So, or you could be justified by, you can live by do this, believe this, and you shall be saved. And that has no merits whatsoever. It is grace. So what you have is grace versus merit and what you have is faith versus works so this is the way of Christ the way of Christ is apart from the doing the way of faith and apart from merit the way of grace the way that is free what is the meaning of free that, it, that God does not look at anything you bring he doesn't look it doesn't cost you anything. It's not something you put before God. For God to say, I'm going to reward that. It's a reward. It's a payment that I'm going to give you. No, it's free. So it's grace. You don't deserve it. You can't deserve it. I'm going to give it to you freely. And it's interesting, the expression here. I mentioned that before. It may be worth a, 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 a reminder where it says, being justified freely by His grace. Okay, freely by His grace. Grace is a gift. And freely is free. I mean, is, can there be a gift that is not free? Well, yes, there was. Because back in the day, uh, you never gave a gift that did not go with certain strings attached. And, and you see that in, uh, in the books of uh, Seneca and the philosophers of the time. You know, he says, you never give a gift that it's going to go to waste. You never give a gift to the unworthy. In other words, they, the, the Roman Greco, the Greco-Roman society was built on, on the giving of gifts, believe it or not. But it was the giving of gifts where you become somebody's sponsor because now you see this man, and this man has great potential, but he doesn't have any money. Is that really a gift though? 
Well, it was, it, it was called giving. It was called gift giving. That's the way they, they called it. Because, yeah, you're giving that person something. You know, they, it's a, you're a benefactor. You're, you're a benefactor of this person, but you're choosing wisely where you're going to put the gift so that the gift will not go to waste. That was the idea. Because if now society collapses, you're, you're, you're wasting your resources on those that cannot do anything back, okay? So the benefactor would put his gifts on someone. That person would utilize the gifts to, for education, for self-advancement, and that person then could contribute back to society, help somebody else, and most importantly also, pay homage to the benefactor. You know, talk up the benefactor in society, which was built on honor and this kind of, uh, you know, reputation. So Paul has to say, this is a gift, freely. This is not a gift given to the worthy. This is not a gift given because of any consideration on the part of the recipient. This is truly a free gift. No strings attached. That was counterculture. That was something unheard of. So the idea then of being justified freely by His grace. How? How is it that we get to receive this gift without us being worthy recipients and being able to do anything in order to merit it through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus? We're set free by the person and the work of Christ for us. Verse 25. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood. What is the meaning of propitiation? It's satisfaction. It's expiation. We had a big debt of guilt. And the Lord takes it out of the way. By his blood he covers it. He atones. Okay. He, he, he covers it and he pushes it out of the way. He rips up the debt. You owe nothing now by my person and my work. Okay. So. Uh, to demonstrate his righteousness. Who is the righteous here? God is. He's demonstrating his righteousness uh, by the sacrifice of Christ. He's being righteous. He's dying. He's taking up the penalty that we deserve and he's living the perfect life that we should live. Through Christ's redemption, there is somebody that is doing the law because the doers of the law will be justified. So somebody is doing the law, but it's doing the law for us. He's standing in our place as the doer of the law. Verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith and works in Jesus. No, it says how? The justifier of the one who what? Who has faith. In Jesus. Pastor, but it doesn't say faith alone. Well, if it's faith versus the doing of the law, right? Uh, I mean, it is, it is assumed that it is excluding the works because the works is the other way of justification. But if it's not clear enough, it's going to continue to be uh, clearer, even though it already is. Now, it, it goes on to say in verse... Um, 28. Okay, verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. What is boasting? Uh huh. I got something to boast about, right? By what law? Of works? No. But by the law of faith. What is the law of works? Do this and you shall live. What is the law of faith? Believe this and you live, right? So if it's just believe and it's believing on the person and the work of Christ. And this is given to me as a gift that I don't deserve and can never repay. Can I boast? There's no boasting there. It is excluded. Boasting is excluded by the principle of grace. Which is the principle of faith. Boasting it can be included by the principle of works. Which is the principle of merit. Right? If I do something I can boast. Okay? Verse 28. Therefore... We conclude that a man is justified by faith together with the works of the law. What does it say? 
apart, without the works of the law. We conclude that a man is justified by faith without, apart from the deeds of the law. Can you not say, by faith alone? Yeah, by faith lying does not works, does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, not the worthy, not the one that is merit worthy, right? But the one who is ungodly. Who gets justified here? A believing person that is ungodly. What is the meaning of ungodly? He's, he does not have, he's not a doer of the law. Right? He's not a doer of the law. He's not conformed to the law. He does not work. Right? He is a sinful. He deserves death. What does he have for him? He believes. And because he believes, he does not work. You see that? That point? To the one who does not work. To the one who does not work but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Okay? Verse 6, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart without works. There's a blessedness, blessedness to a man that God says, hey, I do not count your sins against you. As a matter of fact, I count you righteous. Because you believe in my son. That is grace. That is the principle of believing. That is how you are justified before God freely. Not by a principle of works. And not by a combination of faith and works. Because it says here. Imputes righteousness apart from works. To him who works it's debt. But to him who does not work but believes only is grace. So God imputes righteousness apart from works. Then we pass the page to uh, Romans 5. And it says in Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified by faith. Apart from works, right? Apart from merit. Without works. Without merit, without your obedience of works, that's how you are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, there's other verses here that I want to read, but I'm going to finish with uh, Titus 3. Titus chapter 3 says the following. Titus 3. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 3. Titus 3 beginning in verse 3. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, you see that? But according to his mercy, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. For what? That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So notice how we're justified. We're justified without working. We're justified apart from the law. We're justified without our merit. We're justified without the doing of works. We're justified without the works, without any works of righteousness. That's how we are justified before God. And then we go back to... Huh? Correct. That's exactly right. Yeah. The idea of gift in the Bible, the gift of grace, it's not the gift of giving you works to be justified, 
Because we're justified without works of righteousness. We're justified without the works of the law. We're justified without any merit of our own. We're justified through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We're justified through faith without the works of the law. So what does that mean? God accepts us without works. And that principle is cardinal. Can I read this yeah. Sure, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let's just add up to that Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You see, we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, not created through good works. You see? So, works are going to be important and works play a, a great role created in Christ Jesus for good works, but not through good works. In other words, good works are not the instrument of salvation. God is not sitting there waiting to see, let me see your faith and good works in order to accept you. No. God grants faith and says, you're accepted on account of Christ. Period. Case closed. Now live in good works. Going back to what you were saying, that's a good example with the uh, man on the cross that died next to Jesus. Yeah, you were saying about what if he had works that he still got saved. Oh, the only word Thank you. Is, is yeah. Or yeah. Like well, so, what is repentance? And we're going to talk about that. We could definitely talk about that. But uh, isn't a work no, it is not a work. It, it, but he did make a declaration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always understood that like, what James was trying to say was that faith, genuine faith will have works. Mm -hmm. yep. Because it's it works your, yeah. your product of your faith. Correct, that's correct. That's, that, that's, that's what we, that's what we want to say. That's, that's what James is saying, okay? And James is making the case. See, James is talking about how faith lands on earth, Okay? That you cannot talk about you have faith, right? And not have that faith affect your life in the world, okay? Not have tangible fruit of that faith in the world. Because when you say that, there's a disconnect. Faith, faith is not there. Number one. What I say, not as I do. Right. Faith is not there. Faith is not, it's not, it's not working. Because what does faith do? Faith wants to work. Faith is not working. Faith is not. The definition of faith is not work. But faith, which is embrace, trust Christ, produces works. So as long as we distinguish that. Yes, yes, very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it's the works. Well, so what if uh, that's, you're not a need, but when you're in need and that brother doesn't come through? Yeah. Let me tell you, I think, I think the main point from what James is saying, if you notice, because James talks about folks, and this is, I think this is key, folks 
that can do anything for you in return. It's the poor, it's the widow, you know, it's the disenfranchised, you know, it's those that, it's those that, it's those that you cannot profit from. Because what, it, what was the idea? I help you, obviously, but I'm going to expect something in return. And it's, and it's those that you will not profit from. Right. right. For example, you can help somebody that can definitely help you back, but won't. Yeah. For whatever reason. That's fine, but that's the idea. The idea is that what, what moves me here is, is, is this, okay? That I was the one that couldn't give anything back. So I was the one that God didn't profit anything from, and he gave me a free gift. So when, when that apprehends and captures my heart, then that is going to motivate me, to compel me, to act likewise. So that's the kind of work there's going to be. So it's, it's very good because, yeah, sometimes people say, well, look at him, what a great individual, how moral, how good, how decent. Hold on, not necessarily because what is moving and motivating that heart? And that's where we're going to get to the judgment part. Because on judgment day, the world is going to be judged in righteous. You know how the world is going to be judged? On the basis of the law. And the law says, love God and love your neighbor. Okay? Now, who is the person that loves? The person that loves is the person that loves Christ, right? The person that loves Christ. Now, everybody in the world is going to be saying, here, I did this good, I did that good. I, you know, here's my good works. Everybody's going to try to defend themselves, right? And uh, my contention, my reading of this judgment according to works is the following. It is not, like Piper says, that, True faith then will have genuine works and those works then will be taken into account on judgment day for acceptance before God. In other words, that God not only accepts you on the basis of faith, but also on the basis of demonstrating that your faith is genuine, that you have works to back that, that faith up. So that is what Piper calls final justification. That you're going to, that the jury is on the basis of both faith and the genuine works of that faith. Okay? So we reject that and say no. We are accepted before God only by faith without regard to our works. And the question arises, then why do we have a judgment according to works? Why is there a judgment according to works, like in Matthew 25, okay? And I think the answer to that is that the Bible says that the whole world is going to be judged in righteousness. It is the doers of the law that will be justified, okay? So everybody comes, and God is opening up the books and saying, okay, let me see your works. Everybody's coming with works, okay? Let me see your works, and then unbelievers are going to try and show their works. But they're not works done in love. Because works done in love, Matthew 25 says, are done for the sake of Christ. When you did this to the little ones of these, for the sake of Christ, you did it as unto me. Now, is that going to be used to say to the Christians, uh-huh, you have not only faith, but you also have works, thereby you're accepted. No. What it's going to show is, you are working freely, because you receive freely the love of God. And that's why you love. In other words, the works of the believer testifies against the works of unbelievers, because it testifies to the love of God. To the righteousness of Christ. We are working in whatever levels of work we're motivated to do for the sake of Christ when we work. Why? Because we know ourselves loved by Christ and covered with this righteousness. So Jesus is going to say, let me show you what a good work is. This is a good work. He loved so and so and did this because he was 
confident in my love and did it in gratitude for my love. He didn't do that to be accepted by me. He accepted the testimony, my testimony in Christ for him. And that's why he worked. Do you have that? Do you have works for the sake of Christ? Do you have true works of love? And they're not going to be able to say that. And we're going to say, yeah, we have works, but we, we weren't expecting to be affirmed and accepted by works. We only did it because of the work of Christ for us. Does that make sense? Can we even say... Did you follow that, though? Did you follow that? Hmm? Can we even say that those are not even our works? They're not our... They, we are working. We are working. But the thing is so that... We're working because Christ and, and the Holy Spirit were being inspired to do. We're being, inspi we're being inspired to do because we are no longer working to get saved. We are working because we have been saved. And that, and that is truly the work of love. It's the work without fear. It's the work of gratitude to God. It's the work for the sake of Christ. The work for the sake of Christ is not a work so that Christ will accept you. A work for the sake of Christ is a work of thanksgiving to Christ. But my question is, Well, as, uh, we can say that it's my work in the sense that I am the, I am the agent. In other words, it, it's my work in the sense that I did it, obviously. It was, the, it was the Holy Spirit producing it in me. But the larger point, I think, is that it goes back to Christ. It points back to Christ in this sense. I did this work because Christ loved me. So I did this work freely, out of love, for the sake of Christ. So notice that then the work and the judgment according to works is not. Okay, you have the work so that I can accept you. No, it's, hey, you are showing by the work that you believed in the work of my son for you. That you realized that you had no righteousness in yourself. And you needed the righteousness of another. And you cry for mercy. And that is then true righteousness. The righteousness of Christ. So whichever way you look at it, by the works, it goes back to Christ. That's why James, that's why John says, and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave himself for us. So we are working because he loved us and he gave himself for us. That is for the sake of Christ. It's not for the sake of obtaining salvation. Like Piper would say, for example, hey, you know, you better straighten up. Otherwise, this is a matter of, of, of going to hell. You don't straighten up. You don't quit that sin. It's a matter of going to hell. Okay? Um, and we, got, we have to reject that. Uh, you know, the, our works are not done for the sake of our going to hell. They are done precisely because we're no longer going to hell. Because we have been saved from condemnation. And if you believe in these works, then how many works does it take? Yeah, that's another thing. Then, but like, yeah. If I do more, do I get more? Sure. Piper would say, as long as you're just uh, striving, as long as you're fighting, as long as you're fighting, you're how right. How you're, 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 well, it must exceed that of the Pharisees, he would say. How much is that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, he, he doesn't have a, a concept of the. Of the covenant of works. That's why then he just goes to. It's something that you, you, you must believe. And you're, you're accepted. But that faith proves itself before God. So what we want to say here with James is. That um, James is talking about a different justification. What, what kind of justification is James, is James talking about? Because justification also means to be vindicated. To be manifested. To be shown. Okay. For example in the gospel it says that. Um, wisdom is justified. By his children. So wisdom is manifested. Is shown. Is demonstrated by the children of wisdom. So those that believe. Are those that in the world. Will be justified. By faith. What does that mean? 
they will show the work of faith in the world. They are, the faith that they have before God, it's a faith that will have works in the world. It's being justified before men, not before God. Okay, it's being justified before the world. It's being shown as what faith does. What is it that faith does? It works. Now, having said that, having said that, I have also advanced another, in, another line of interpretation. Okay, that one is fine. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That is true. If a person has absolutely no works whatsoever, no love for God in response to what? I know I'm saved. I thank you, Jesus. I love you. And there is a certain minimal kind of response and fruitfulness that person has no faith. But I think James is saying more than that. Or he's tackling, he's tackling another, uh, another uh, something else he's saying to the church and it's the following. You who are a believer and you who, has, you who have faith, um, when your faith is not showing, your faith is not profitable. It's good for nothing in the world. You may be saved, but at the time that your faith is not showing, your faith is as good as dead. It, it benefits no one. So it's important that we recognize that because if we only go the route of he who doesn't have works does not have faith, there are many times, or, or we could also say, um, you know, um, we can always scrutinize our works and our fruits, right? And we could come up how? Short. I mean, I for one have a tendency to judge my, myself harshly. I don't know about you guys and how you go about doing that, okay? But there would be then despair, in our lives. Or there would be then a constant, you know, uh, tension to look for the works so that I can say, oh, thank God I'm a believer. Whew, thank God I see, I'm seeing that I'm loving somebody. Ah, I have some work. So, you know, I can now make sure, I can now validate that I'm a Christian. I don't think that's the way the Bible tells us to go about our assurance. Um, I don't think it's the way the Bible tells us to go about um, validating ourselves before God. I think what James is saying here, oh, before I say that, I do believe that works is a line of evidence, is a kind of evidence that we are in the faith, but not the primary kind of evidence. The primary testimony that we belong to Christ is the promise itself. It's the promise of the gospel itself that says, I justify you without your works. You see your sins? Yes, I do see them. In other words, there are some that are going to have a tendency to see their sins. To be conscious of their sins. Others may have a tendency to see their righteousness. I don't know. I mean, that's not my experience though, okay? However, when... When put to the, to the test, I can see good works in me. I could see fruits in me, right? But when I examine myself, the first, thing, the first thing that I grab onto is what? My sins. My sins. And what saves me from my sins and gives me assurance to go back before God is that I hear in the promise, I was given for sinners, not for the righteous. I was given for those that fall short. So that is our primary line of assurance. Don't look first to works for your assurance. And that is a way that many folks want to go about it. And I think that's detrimental and destructive. Okay? If you're honest, it's going to cause you to despair. If you're not too honest, you're going to go the route of a little bit of a Pharisee. Okay? So look to Christ first. And here in the promise, I was, do you see the burden of your sins? Do you see your sins? What is repentance? Do you see your sins? Do you acknowledge the weight of your sins and it is a heavy burden on you? Do you see Christ given freely for sinners? And do you believe in Him? Yes, that's repentance. 
That's repentance. You haven't worked yet. You have just what? Turn from you to Christ. From your sins to the salvation of Christ. That's repentance. The fruits are that. Works that follow. But we are not saved by the works of repentance. When we repent, we work. They are fruits. Because repentance comes with an assurance. The assurance that a Savior was given for me. So repentance must include in it faith. You cannot define repentance without faith. And you cannot define faith without repentance. He who repents is he who believes. Now what is the part of repentance? That there is a grieving of sin. There's a woundedness of sin. And there's a confession that I am worthy. That I am guilty. The law has done its work. It accuses me. I am guilty. I fall short. But then, for it to be truly repentance, then I trust in Christ for my salvation. That is repentance. We repent in faith. And we believe repenting. Does that make sense? So, he who believes like that is saved without works. Now, the other tack that I was saying that we also must, must look at is that don't say, hey, you know, I got faith. That's it. I got it. That's all I need. Because God has called you to a blessing. To the blessing of what? The blessing of the fruit of your works. The blessedness of obedience. Loving God and loving neighbor is the way of blessedness. It's the way that is profitable. Do you think that's something that mm -hmm. people uh, would try to do, to achieve? Or is this something that is merely just the fruit of being? Okay. It's the fruit of being, but it must be exhorted. Because the Bible does it. You see? But what I mean is, like, <clears throat> okay, so I can do a good work, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I want to try to do yeah. reasons. Yeah. I can do that. That's something I decide to do. Sure. But I think also just the fact that, that there's, that I, you know, I see God's love for me, and, mm -hmm. God, mm -hmm. and that relationship drives me to do it. Sure, that is what's so good. It's more like, yeah. the way I say it, it's more yeah. like, because I am, sure. I will do this. It, it, so it's almost like not well, something that I can, I mean, I can also try to do certain good things, mm -hmm. but it's like I'm, yeah. there's an impulse. But here's the thing, though. The thing with James is that uh, James wants us asking of God for these works. That's why he says at the beginning, at the very beginning, when you find yourself in trials, and the trials are temptations. Temptations to go the way of sin. To not do either. To not, because if you go the way of sin, you don't do good works, right? So the trials are temptations to go the way of sin. And then he says, confess it. See that the Father is the giver of every good gift. He's saying, be a doer of, the, of this work. He's saying there, come to the Father in patient waiting and asking. For the healing of your souls and the profitableness of sanctification of good works in you and for your neighbor. So why do I believe that? Because it says here, can, can faith save him? Okay, can faith alone save us? Paul says, yes, faith alone can save us. Okay, now can faith save you in the sense that it can be profitable if there are no works in your life and there are no works shown in the world to neighbor, what is the profit of that? I mean, there's nothing. So the standpoint of James is not eternal. I think it's not eternal salvation. The argument is there to say, yeah, he who doesn't have any works whatsoever is not saved. But is that really what James is saying though? Is that really the argument of James when he talks to, to the 12 tribes and, you know, be patient and wait in trials and ask of God so that you will receive? Okay, we could say, yeah, there could be a general principle there to say, hey, if you never receive anything and if you're not working at all, you know, check out your faith because then you don't have faith. That's fine. We'll accept that. But I think James is saying something else. He's saying to us who struggle with the lack of works, who struggle with doing what God calls us to do, who struggle with being patient and waiting for the harvest of righteousness from the Lord. He's saying to us, hey, 
Unless you're on that path and you're in your seeking of God to work in you, to provide in you the good works, there's no profit in the world. In the world, not before God. You see what I'm saying? Not before God. Before God, you may be saved. It's, it's, what, it's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3. For example, in 1 Corinthians 3, it says, um, 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay? So we have the foundation. We have believed in Christ. Now, verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what kind it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Do you hear that? He himself will be saved. So I think that James is not... Um, only, let's just put it that way, it's not only saying, if you don't have any works, you don't have faith, but he's saying, hey, works are profitable. Works are necessary. For what? The works that you get from God are healing for your soul because in order to work a work, you are working through love. And love is the healing of what? Of your soul. When you love, your soul has what? It's healing. Not perfectly, but it's, it's the faith that you have before God is working. It's healing you from the inside out. And that translates not only in healing for you, but also health for who? For the neighbor. That's why it goes on to say here, if a, notice, notice then how James follows that. James says, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? So it, it, what does it stand for? What does faith profit? What does faith profit? If you say, if you say to a neighbor, Hey, I have the gospel, go and be warmed. What does it profit? Now, you may be saved. You may be, I'm not, that's what I'm saying, that we need to make room for this. You may be saved, but oftentimes we have failed to put our faith into what? Into works. And when we do that, it, it doesn't profit. It doesn't do what faith was given us to do. It was, it was given us to be justified and saved before God, but not just for that. It was given us so that we would work. And be rich in good works. So when faith is not getting there, faith is not being perfected in good works. What does that mean being perfected? That faith alone doesn't save us before God? No, no. What is showing there, the word perfect also means to, to reach the goal, right? To, to get to its proper end. And the proper end for which faith has given us in the world is for it to profit someone. To profit my neighbor. So I think James is exhorting the church and Christians. Yes, definitely to say, if you have absolutely no works, then you, you don't have any faith. Yeah, that fits there. But, you know, what do we do with that? When we fail to see the works, well, we know that we're justified with our works before God. So we thank God for the promise. And after we look to the promise... Then we're going to see the love of God that is compelling us to work. So let patience have its full work. What does that mean? Let abiding in faith in Christ lead you to the doing of good work so that it will be profitable in the world. Justified, vindicated as the faith that works in the world and it is manifested as profitable. Healing your soul in the process of gradual sanctification and being of help and profit to your neighbor. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. 
It goes so that they may glorify the Father in the day of visitation. Yeah, they will know you by your love. Absolutely. So it is vindicated in the world, in the world by our love. Obviously, it's our love, but it's the love that comes for the sake of Christ. And it all points to Christ anyway. And it will, end, it will point to Christ. And in Judgment Day, it will lead all the way back to Christ's righteousness. I think it, not only that, but it points to Christ here now. Uh, these, in, these, in the day of visitation, yes. People may not realize it. I mean, unbelievers, you, may, may. you may do a good work for them. Well, they may, they may, they may That's think, the they may say, well, that person's so nice, you know, that person didn't have to help me and they did this or that. Well, now, saying, yeah. Like, I'm sorry, I'm just saying, like, for example, people know you at your job, right? You're a Christian. And then you have certain fruits, right? Sure. That reveal that people go, okay, wait, maybe it's for real. Correct, correct. Maybe you take a look yeah, it. yeah. You know? Maybe, so maybe. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Now, it says, uh, in Peter, it says that they may glorify God on the day of visitation. So I think it's the assumption that. The unbeliever cannot really figure us out completely, but they can say, they can see that, a good, that you've done something good to them. You've been, not, you've been good to them. Why? Right. Because right. nobody else is good to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He has nothing to profit, maybe. Right. So they, they benefit from, from, your, from the faith that works. And you know that mention of like the true religion. What is true religion? Mm -hmm. Yes. It, it's Thank the you. Same thing. Yeah, so we also said that James uh, says true religion to speak of the practice. Because James is focused on what? On the way that that faith ought to affect us in the world. Uh, on the way that that faith ought to cause us to tremble. What does it mean? It's interesting that the word religion, when I looked it up, uh, one of the roots is trembling. Meaning to be affected in, in worship, to be moved. In worship, it's a it's a worship that you are affected by. So true affectation uh, would be then that that faith shows itself in good works for those like you before God that did not deserve it and cannot do anything for you, because now you have all things in Christ and you give yourself freely. David, also, like yeah. You were mentioning that the day of um, the, day we, the world is judged because. Of Mm -hmm. That those people that are being self-defense, uh, yeah. people, and actually, uh, yeah. it actually says that yeah. uh, when it comes to us, it'll say, "Oh, but when do I? When was it? Correct. The right. Exactly. Right. When right. was it? Because you don't know. You don't even. You don't even know. You're just doing it, like he said, out of yeah. love, and you don't even know when did I come to you. And you're I not know. doing the check mark. You're not doing the check mark. What, yeah, you're, so we thought were really good. what you're actually yeah. doing is what you're actually doing is confessing. You're actually seeing the imperfection of your works, and you're never satisfied with them. So you're always seeking for a righteousness greater than your works. And that is the righteousness of Christ. And you're always trying to grasp that righteousness by faith to feel the comfort, the peace. So notice, for the believer, the peace does not come from doing. It comes from believing. And as you believe, you do. So you do freely. It happens, but it's a constant struggle of the flesh getting in the way of giving and loving freely. But as long as you keep apprehending the good father that is the giver of every good gift, that's James' language, you will keep on having fruit. Fruit, imperfect and stained by your flesh. That's why we keep on confessing. And we keep on asking the Lord to help us. <clears throat> Does that mean? Yeah. The responsibility always comes, I think, by the fact that God has put us under a law. In other words, we're not free from the responsibility to do. When we hear God's commands, we must say, that's, that is our duty and responsibility. You know, love your neighbor, kind of cover right. You. It says, you must do this. You must do this. The question is that, you know, we realize that we don't do it, that we fall short, that it's stained with all our imperfections, and then we practice righteousness by going to Christ. We practice righteousness because then we go to Christ with repentance and faith and say, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Help me now, Lord. And as we go to Christ with and, and receive the consciousness of forgiveness and of beloved children, then we go back out again. So we hear the law and we submit to it. But how do we submit to it? In Christ, by saying, forgive me. 
I need you. Are you with me? And then the promise is, yes, I am. I will always be. Without your works. And then from there, then we freely give ourselves. That's why Luther would say, would say the Christian is free of all. But at the same time, a debtor of all. It's free of all because in a way, I don't have to do it to be accepted by God. So I'm free. And it's truly when I internalize that and the more I internalize that I'm free, that I can freely become the servant of others. And you're, and this, by that, you're always in debt. Because how can you ever love your neighbor yeah. enough and yourself? Yeah. Yeah, we always fall short. Yeah. Don't you want everything yeah. for yourself? Yeah. You should want the same for your neighbor. So I would, I would probably submit to you that the one that is um, noticing the way that you fall short um, is the one that most likely uh, is acting in faith. How do we know that? From the example of the Pharisee and the publican. One is saying, I do this, I do that. But the Christian first says, I don't do it, I'm sorry, forgive me, help me. I need you, Lord. So that's the, that's the route from which the, from which the horse comes out of the gate. The horse comes out of the gate through, forgive me, Lord, I need you. And, and then it comes out running insofar as it hears a promise as says, go. I don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. And that frees us to go. And we hear, go and sin no more. And we go. And as we go and run a couple of steps, we sin again. And we're back in the gate. And God again says to us, I don't condemn you. What are you doing here trying to, you think oh, you're back in, in prison? No, you're not. You're free. I love you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Go back, take another two, three steps, right? And that's how we just run the race. Let's pray, guys. I have to go. With the Father, thank you. Father, once again, we confess our sins and, Father, are aware of the many ways that um, we don't act, Lord, in keeping with the true uh, spirit and command of your law. And ask that once again you would receive us, Lord, as we are um, asking, Father, for mercy. And we're asking, Lord, that you would help us to believe, to trust that we may freely give, Lord, once again and do all the good works that an assured faith is busy doing. We need you, Father. Continue to do this work in us that we may be profitable, profitable servants. We ask you these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.